Welcome, everyone, to this week's edition of the Commercial Real Estate 101 Meetup Group. Uh, for those of you guys who are tuning in for the first time, we actually started this group back in April of 2020, kind of in response to COVID. But ever since then, we've had the opportunity to speak to a host of different commercial real estate content creators and really leaders in the space uh, to highlight a variety of different commercial real estate topics. And we really have become kind of a watering hole for commercial real estate content. In today's video, what I want to do was kind of pivot slightly uh, just to kind of fill in uh, for uh, the episode. So this is actually going to be an episode that I had uh, where John John Kasman, uh, the host of Multifamily Insights, uh, in, interviewed me regarding the retail space. So in this episode, we highlight a little bit about my background, uh, what got me into the commercial real estate brokerage space, and then we get deep we deep dive into retail investing and retail analysis. Uh, so we talk a lot about you know, all the different nuances of how you perform due diligence on these real estate uh, opportunities, in particular in the retail space. So hopefully you gain some value from this video. I'd love to hear your engagement in the con in the comments or really any other medium that you're listening to this to. We're really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. But without further ado, let's go ahead and dive right into this episode. Retail is ever evolving. And so I think that educating yourself on what is going to be feasible going forward in the retail business is really what's going to allow you to be successful within that space. Welcome to Multifamily Insights, the show to help you succeed as an apartment investor. Listen in as John Kasman interviews experts to help you find the best places to invest, attract investors, and scale your portfolio. This is Multifamily Insights with your host, John Kasman. Welcome to Multifamily Insights. I'm your host, John Kasman, and I want to thank you for joining us for another great episode. Now, if this is your first time checking us out, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. And if you're a returning listener, well, make sure you leave us a rating and review. We'd love to hear from you, know what's working for you for the show, and also hear what you'd love to learn more about. Now, today we've got a great episode. We're going to be talking to Rafael Coyazo. Now, if you're interested in multifamily and you want to review a sample deal, you are in luck. We have a special download on our website of a sample deal package. Just go to kasmancapital.com slash sample deal, and you'll also join our mailing list to get tips and exclusive investment opportunities. Again, that's kasmancapital.com slash sample deal. Rafael Coyazo is a licensed commercial real estate agent specializing in income producing properties. Now, he is a full time commercial real estate agent, and he's also the author of the Millennial Playbook series, a book series that focuses on personal and professional development topics for young professionals. His latest book, Before You Sign That Lease, helps business owners with the often difficult process of leasing up commercial real estate. Let's welcome to the show, Rafael Coyazo. Awesome. Well, thanks for hosting me, man. I'm honored to be here. Like I said, prior to us hopping on the call, I've followed your stuff for a while. So really excited to talk and, and discuss a little bit about commercial real estate, which I'm very passionate about. I oh, appreciate that. Thank you very much. Well, listen, I went over your bio at a very, very high level. Why don't you take two minutes and give us a little bit more context? Sure. Yeah, I know. So prior to us hopping on the call, I was kind of telling them a little bit of background prior to me even getting into commercial real estate. I actually was born in Northeast Italy. My mother's Italian. My dad's Puerto Rican. He was a pediatrician in the Air Force. So we traveled around Europe until I was about 14, ultimately ended up in Belgium at Supreme Headquarters, Allied Powers Europe, which is Nader headquarters. And then after that, I went to high school in Southern Arizona, uh, went to Arizona State University, got a degree in industrial engineering and economics, and then jumped into the software space. So I was a software implementation consultant for a large enterprise that implemented software systems for government agencies across the nation and abroad. And so I had the privilege of working in Washington, D.C. on a large software project and I moved to Puerto Rico. And I was there on a big project to replace the financial software system for the island. And ultimately, I ended up in Louisville, Kentucky, where we helped the city replace their financial software system. And back in mid-2019, transitioned over to the brokerage end, commercial real estate, and I've been doing it ever since. So that's a quick overview of me to this day, as far as my career is concerned. And yeah, I'm just excited to be here. And again, the commercial real estate industry is a phenomenal industry for those who really want to capitalize on it. I uh, appreciate you giving us that quick background on what you've been doing. So you really started more in software and being a software engineer before transitioning into commercial real estate. Give us a little more context on that. How do you go from the software side to commercial real estate? That's a great question. It's a question I get asked a lot. So don't get me wrong. I'm an engineer by trade. I love solving complex problems and 
the job that I was in before was a very lucrative job and very much intellectually stimulating job. But one thing about that previous career was that it was very transitory. I was moving every year and a half to two years. And it was fun when you were 24, 25. But as you start getting a little bit older, and you start considering having a family and building out something for yourself. It's very hard to maintain that network that you need in order to build a successful business. And so right around the time, I would say 2017, 2018, I started thinking about what the next move was going to look like. And my mom is a residential agent in Arizona, and she'd always kind of encouraged me to get my license, even in college. And when your parents tell you to do something, a lot of times you just don't even listen to them until that right moment in time where you're just like, oh, maybe they were right. So started looking at the option of potentially getting my license to do residential real estate. But then as I started doing more research on the residential end and commercial end, commercial just spoke to me more. I actually had a small catering company in college. It was called Posticity. It was a pasta catering company. And so I always deemed myself somewhat entrepreneurial. And the idea of being able to work with business owners and investors and deal with numbers on a regular basis kind of appealed to me more. And so that's kind of where I gravitated towards. So I finished my licensing and then started interviewing with different brokerages in town. And I interviewed with the larger brokerages and then also some of the boutique brokerages. And ultimately, I ended up at a boutique brokerage called the Grisanti Group. Paul, who's the broker, just is kind of took me under his wing. And he's just been phenomenal as far as the insights he's been able to provide me. And again, it's just been a great transition. But that was the logic for it when I decided to do it. What's your focus in a commercial space, right? We say commercial real estate, that could be anything from retail to self-storage to multifamily. So what's your expertise and where do you focus? Yeah. So we're a boutique brokerage. So we do a little bit of everything and I've done a little bit of a lot of stuff, but I would say the areas that I've done the most in is probably retail investment, in particular shopping centers. I've done several smaller multifamily deals and I've been doing a decent amount on the leasing side for industrial real estate recently. So I would say as far as the most I've had experience with is on the retail investment side and the shopping center side. So obviously the last couple of years have been different, <laughs> to put it mildly, for commercial real estate. Some sectors were hit a little harder than others. When you talk about kind of the shopping centers and commercial retail side of things, how did that industry fare? How did that sector fare in comparison to other sectors? You're 100% right. And I think it is very much specific to the type of use. So I've worked on several shopping center deals where it was much more heavy service use. So you're talking nail salons, barbershops, restaurants, things that are a lot more difficult to replicate on an Amazon scale. But then also you got to think that a lot of these service space, even medical uses have found that locating in these types of centers can be very attractive as well. So I sold a center last year that had a variety of different tenants, including a bakery. We had a boba shop. It had a smoke shop. It had a nail salon, barber shop. And then in the back, there was this large pediatric clinic and it was like 10,000 square foot space. The tenant had been in place for over 40 years and they were at below market rents, but they couldn't really leave the center because of the fact that that center had a significant amount of parking in an area that just isn't very, it's not easy to find parking. And so it was kind of like a symbiotic type of relationship between a lot of the tenants. And so that's one of the reasons why it made it most attractive. But I think with retail, which is what, what's very interesting is it's on a case by case basis. So you really have to dig into the leases and get an understanding of the dynamics within the center as far as the tenant mix is concerned and how each tenant fares. Because a tenant that maybe is a mom and pop shop may not be as in a strong financial, enough strong enough financial position, whereas maybe a multi location franchisor could be a very strong tenant. So again, it's just a case by case analysis piece when you're looking at these types of opportunities. Many of our listeners do focus more on multifamily. And if they come across a mixed use deal or a deal that has some retail, some will completely ignore it while I think others are starting to get more and more curious about those opportunities. How would you evaluate those opportunities or work with kind of an investor who mainly has a multifamily background? Yeah, that's a great question. And we actually have a lot of investors locally that are looking for more of mixed use properties, not only for the multifamily play, but also the short term rental play. A lot of times in municipalities, in particular with us here in Louisville, if you have a residential property, in order for it to be utilized as a short term rental, you either have to physically live there or have a conditional use permit. And they're becoming a lot more restrictive on who can access these types of conditional use permits because they don't want entire streets to become short-term rentals, as you're seeing in a lot of these major markets. And so one of the ways to get around that is to find commercial properties that are maybe mixed use and then have retail store in the bottom. And then on top, you could potentially incorporate some form of short-term rentals. And so we've seen that here in the market recently. As far as retail viability, I mean, the biggest thing for retail is rent is a function of the amount of sales that you can achieve at a particular location. And a lot of times what drives that is visibility, accessibility and traffic counts. What's the foot traffic in the area? If it's a daytime uh, retail, like a 
restaurant that's located next to an office building? What's the daytime foot traffic in the area? What is the demographics? What type of uses? So you wouldn't put a luxury store in an area that's maybe a middle income or lower income area. So, I mean, there's so many things you have to consider. And a lot of those data points you can access via site to do business. That's the type of software that I utilize in order to access a lot of that data. I mean, it's game changing, really. You mentioned visibility, accessibility. What was the third thing? Visibility, accessibility, and traffic counts, like or foot traffic. It's either traffic counts or foot traffic. And then also parking helps a lot too, depending on what the uses are. Some uses don't necessarily require a significant amount of parking, but then there's other uses that are parking hogs. So the tenant mix in a center is going to be very, it's going to depend on how the center performs. And now that with COVID, another thing that's become even more of a premium is drive throughs So drive through capabilities, when you're looking at these types of opportunities, can be a significant value add play in the retail space. Yeah, to play that back, I mean, you said there are four things that are really key elements to consider if you're going to go into retail investing. One is visibility. So can you literally see this thing from this tree? Can people see it? Is it easy to access, right? Second is accessibility. So again, where is it at? How easy is it to actually get into the shopping center? Third is traffic, right? Your traffic count, how much foot traffic is coming into the property. And then last, parking or even the drive-through capability. Those are things that people are looking for. And if you are a resident or a tenant, I should say, in this case, those are kind of features that you're going to be looking for as well if you're going to set up shop in a specific location. So four things to keep in mind if you are looking at investing in retail. For folks who are looking at that space, I know the leases are very different than you're dealing with a residential resident. So you're not dealing with kind of 12 month lease where you're basing it on the individuals and their income. You're now looking at really a different set of rules or a different set of items. Talk to us a little bit more about what we need to look for when we are looking at a lease for more of a retail resident. That's a phenomenal question. You're 100% right. When you're talking about retail leases, first off, multifamily leases are typically modified gross in the commercial real estate term. Essentially, what modified gross is, gross leases is that you pay one flat rent, it covers everything. With a modified gross, typically, you're responsible for covering either utilities, water, et cetera. So that's what you would typically see in a multifamily setting. In retail, it can run the gamut. It really just depends. And there's a lot of value add opportunity if you read these leases and determine, hey, Maybe there's a gross lease in place, meaning the tenant pays one fat rent and the landlord's responsible for paying the water, utilities, taxes, insurance, et cetera. Whereas if the market itself incorporates triple net leasing, which if for those of you guys who are listening, triple net incorporates that the tenant pays their pro rata share of taxes, insurance, general maintenance on the property. So if it's a multi-tenant center and it's 5,000 square feet and a tenant occupies 2,500 square feet, they occupy half the space within the center. Therefore, they pay half the taxes, insurance, and general maintenance on the property. And so as far as looking at the leases are concerned, they aren't always the same. So like with the shopping center that we sold last, that I represented the buyer on last year, there were 11 different leases and nine different templates. So it was crazy. Literally, we had to look through each and every lease and then create a lease abstract. What a lease abstract is, is a summary of what exactly is within the leases. And I have like this Excel template that I use and I isolate, okay, what's the start date of the lease? What's the end date of the lease? Are there any options on the lease? Which is another term that's very common within commercial real estate, which dictates that a tenant has the option to renew their lease at some predetermined rates for a certain period of time. So if you sign a three-year lease and you have an option for a three-year term on the end, that means that after your three years is up, you have the right to now renew for another three years at some predetermined rate. Now that can be beneficial if it's within mark if it's at market rate, but there are a lot of situations where landlords are not necessarily the most sophisticated and they'll give their tenants a three-year lease with four three-year options. So they can literally tie up that space for 12 years. And so that's something we see a decent amount where it's you look at these retail opportunities, they're in a great location. They may have a lot of the things that you would look for when you're looking at retail investment opportunities, but the way the leases are structured are very poor and it's holding down the value of the property. So I guess suffice it to say that the leases are really what's going to make or break an investment opportunity for retail investors. Yeah, it sounds like the value add opportunity is really in understanding the leases and what's common for the market and finding that gap where you can increase the leases and get what the fair market value actually is. So great insights right there. There's some folks right now who are like, sounds great. I have no interest in retail First of all, why would someone consider retail? I mean, multifamily has been on a tear. 
a lot of people understand multifamily is kind of more straightforward. So for the folks you're talking to and the people you deal with, why do they choose to invest in retail or some of these other commercial real estate sectors as opposed to multifamily? Great question. And I think part of it is really just getting a feel for whether or not it's something you're interested in. As far as one of the main things that a lot of people talk about pertaining to retail is like, oh, Amazon's going to destroy retail, right? It's going to become the next behemoth and really take retail by storm. And it has. I mean, there's no doubt about it. They have been eating up market share. But I was interviewing a gentleman who several weeks ago or several months ago, I should say, on a commercial real estate one-on-one meetup group that I run. And he only invests in retail. And he was telling me back in 2019, he was at a ICSC conference, which is the International Council of Shopping Centers. And they were talking about the proportion of total sales via online or digital sales versus just in-person retail. And at the time in 2019, everyone that was saying, oh, Amazon has a 40% market share or 30% market share, when in reality, the total percentage of retail sales done online was 7%. So the idea that these online behemoths are just destroying the market is a little bit overblown. Although with COVID, it has increased. I think now it's at 13 or 14%, which is definitely nothing to snuff at at all. But I think the idea that retail as we know it is dead is far from it. And not only that, but you're starting to see it as now uh, restrictions are being lifted. A lot more people like to get out there and engage with their families. And I think if you find opportunities with service-based retail in particular, like the nail salons, the bakeries, the restaurants, and even medical uses within these centers, insurance offices, I mean, retail itself doesn't necessarily have to be a frame store. It doesn't necessarily have to be an apparel store, or it doesn't necessarily even have to be like a Macy's or some of these other larger big box department stores that are starting to go the way of the dinosaur. Retail is ever evolving. And so I think that educating yourself on what is going to be feasible going forward in the retail business is really what's going to allow you to be successful within that space. Yeah. I know some of the investors I speak to who are in the space, they say one of the things they like is maybe it's a little less wear and tear on the property, right? Because you only have daytime tenants there as opposed to people who are living at it and using it as their home. You have a little less toilets, right? A little less plumbing issues and things of that nature as well. No showers. So that may facilitate things. And then you started to allude to the leases, but now you're talking about leases where the tenants are responsible for a good number of the expenses, whether it be utilities, taxes, insurance. If the tenants are paying for some of that, if not all of that, that makes it a little more attractive. I think the natural question then is, are the returns a little bit lighter as well. So when you think about the return expectations, how have you seen that kind of adjust over the last few years? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question as well. I would say in the single tenant net lease side, so for those of you guys who are listening, single tenant net lease is typically the Walgreens or the Dollar Generals or some of these large big box corporate tenants that are essentially leasing properties for an extended period of time. And the reason why they would want to lease properties to begin with is because a dollar invested in their business is going to typically be way higher than the same dollar being invested in real estate. Imagine if you get a 7 or 8% return if you buy a piece of property outright and you have no debt on it. Whereas if you were to put that dollar to work in your business, you're getting 15 to 20%. Why would you own your real estate? And so that's what you're seeing a lot with like quick service fast casual dining type of restaurants is that they want to scale to a large degree, it's a lot easier to be able to do that from leasing real estate. Now, those types of opportunities that are corporately backed leases, cap rates have compressed significantly on those. And a lot of that has to do with 1031 exchange money. And I think you're probably seeing that in multifamily real estate. It's like, it's a crazy market out there. And so if you're going to sell your property and it's appreciated by a significant amount, you don't want to have to pay the capital gains taxes. It's got to find a home somewhere. And a lot of the times it's found a home and buying up these Walgreens that have like 25 year leases and the return metrics on those, if you get a 50% loan to value or something is still going to be pretty low, but it's literally no maintenance on their end. So it just depends on what you want to do as an investor. If you're a value add investor, it may not be really attractive to you, but if you're someone who's built up a pretty big nest egg and you just want to have the mailbox money, as they say, I mean, why not place your money in these corporately back lease opportunities? As far as value add opportunities within retail, I mean, again, it's a case by case basis. So it's really just getting your feet on the ground and getting an understanding of where the retail corridors are and getting understanding of what the dynamics are within your market and seeing if you can find opportunities to add value. No, I appreciate that. Let's talk a little bit more about the market, right? So you are in Louisville, uh, market we know really well and have some investments in that market. But as you look at the Louisville market for someone who is not familiar, how would you describe it? It's a great market. One thing is I've traveled a lot in my lifetime. I'm a big traveler. I've been over, I think, over 40 countries. But 
one of the cool things about Louisville is it's a big enough city, right? We're talking about 1.2, 1.3 million people, but it still feels like a small town. So you're able to kind of get to know people pretty well and you get to know the movers and shakers within the city relatively easily compared to like a New York or Chicago or some of these other major markets. And so that's one thing I've enjoyed about being in the market. As far as the business landscape is concerned, I mean, we have some pretty decent sized brands. Humana is the number one employer. It's primarily a health insurance company. It's one of the largest in the world. We have the Yum brands like KFC, Taco Bell, et cetera. We're also a relatively big logistics hub. So we have a pretty strong industrial backbone. We have UPS, we have FedEx. They have a second headquarters here as well. So I remember reading it somewhere. I think it's like from Louisville, you can access 58 or 59% of the US population within a day's drive. So it is one of those centralized locations that businesses find value in. As far as affordability is concerned, it's a very affordable market considering the size. So from a cash flow perspective, in particular for multifamily, it can be a much more attractive market than, let's say, San Francisco or some of these other coastal markets that the cash flow is almost non-existent at this point, especially with the amount of monies out there and cap rates being compressed. So that's just kind of a quick overview of the market itself. I don't know if you have any other particular questions you'd like me to answer. No, I think that's a great way to think about it, right? You're talking about a market that is growing. So it's seeing not ridiculously double digit growth like some of the coastal markets like Phoenix, but it's stable. And I believe that it is sustainable, right? It's the sustainable growth there. And you talked about it. I think a lot of the growth right now is coming from the logistics section. And if you think about what's happened over the last couple of years, with more and more people starting to buy things online and getting them delivered to themselves, well, you need those shipping companies, right? You need the UPS and the FedEx to get it from those warehouses to the driver and ultimately to your front door. And we believe that that's just going to continue to happen. I mean, people are going to want things faster and faster every single day once they start getting used to it, right? You order something, the next question is how fast can it get to me? So we are seeing more and more investment in that space. And Louisville has some pockets where you're seeing more and more growth as these companies try to meet that demand. And I love your point about you being able to drive to 58% of the country within a day. I mean, it's centrally located, really easy access to get to most parts of the country. So there are a lot of things to like about the Louisville market. For someone who is maybe in a different city, maybe not Louisville and starting to maybe try to learn their city, their market in the same way. And maybe whether it be for multifamily or commercial real estate, what are the ways they should go about it, right? If you want to learn about your local market and maybe some of the information that we're talking about today, where are some resources or some things you can do to learn more about that market? And that's another great question. I would say one of the things that if you want to keep in tune with what's going on in the local market, subscribing to some form of business journal is super helpful. I read the Louisville Business Journal whenever the publication's released to get a feel for what's going on and if there's a different projects come down the pike and if there's any incentives from different government agencies that may be beneficial to some sort of commerce. As far as other things are concerned, depending on what property type you're trying to invest in, getting a feel for where the major pockets of those types of properties are. So for example, here in Louisville, we've got several industrial parks. We've got the Waterson Industrial Park. We have the Bluegrass Industrial Park. We've got several different industrial parks. So if you're looking to invest in industrial, maybe drive around those areas and get a feel for what's out there. And similar in the multifamily space, like getting a feel for what the product that's out there, right? is in a particular area within Louisville, maybe in the Highlands, for example, which is a neighborhood here in Louisville, you're going to see a lot more of older properties. Whereas maybe further east you go, those are where the newer developments have been occurring. So the product type is going to be a lot more recent or newer. So again, I think a lot of it has to do with just driving around town, talking to people that are in the industry, whether they're commercial agents or maybe joining some organizations that are in the commercial real estate space, whether that's a local investor group or there's other groups out there like the International Council of Shopping Centers, there's apartment investment associations. Again, just getting involved in conversing with people that are in the industry and then driving around your town and getting a feel for where the business corridors are, where the pockets that are growing. Again, I think that's really where you're going to get the most value. No, great insights there. I mean, there are definitely resources available, but you want to understand your market, understand where the growth is, what companies are there. You mentioned kind of Humana and Yum Brands before. What's happening with those companies? Are they growing? Where are they developing? Are they hiring? Are they expanding? You really want to understand what's happening with the infrastructure. You talked about subscribing to those local business journals, right, where you can read. What are the updates? What are the economic growth committees? What are they doing? What are they talking about? So really starting to understand where that is. And that's going to help you understand where those opportunities may be. And maybe they're not there today, but where are the areas where you're seeing a lot of interest? 
where is that taking place? And you can start to kind of get in front of it so you know where those opportunities will be moving forward. You know, I want to transition, Raphael, and talk a little bit more about you're a relatively newer agent, right? So you've had some success in just a couple of years. And there are probably people who are looking to either A, be an agent themselves or grow and kind of build their client base as a newer agent, but as well as investor clients who are trying to build that relationship with these brokers. And maybe you can just give us some insights of that dynamic and what can you do as a broker to build your client base? And then as for that investor, what can they do to better stand out with those brokers so that they can get more deals? Yeah. And you mean, we could probably talk about that for an hour, really. There's a lot of different things at play. As far as getting started in your career, I think joining a team or not necessarily a team, but joining a brokerage where you have the support that you're going to need. Because again, it's a new business. And particularly if you don't have a sales background, learning how to source business is a skill. It's not a natural born talent. Maybe some people have a propensity to be better at it than others, but it's still a skill you got to exercise. And so joining a place that's going to be supportive of you and provide you with training and maybe even loop you in on some deals when you first start out is extremely beneficial. So that's what I would say first and foremost. And then also on the digital marketing side, I think I've been pushing heavily on that as well, along with concerted outreach efforts. But again, digital is the way of the future. Although maybe the people who are owning the commercial real estate right now may not be the target demographic on the digital platform. I think that over the next 10 to 15 years, there's going to be one of the largest wealth transfers in history occur where baby boomers start transferring wealth over to their heirs. And those individuals who are engaging with content today are the decision makers of tomorrow. So although digital content may not directly lead to business for you today, it will most certainly do so in the future. And so I always tell people that if you can have a concerted effort to create some form of digital content, whether that's podcast, YouTube, meetups, and then record them, et cetera. So that sort of thing as well. As far as investors looking to build relationships with brokers, being a little bit more, I would say, personal with your approaches. Because I mean, I get calls all the time. So people say, hey, keep me in mind if you have 40 units to 200 units, class B, C, 60 units a door, like that sort of thing. Like you get that consistently. So how is that going to make you stand out? So Bo Barry, I had the pleasure of interviewing him. He's a big time multifamily broker in Florida. I think he just specializes in the northern half of Florida. And this guy like knows exactly who owns what. He identified all the product types within that northern region of Florida. And he told us that essentially the individuals who make a concerted effort to reach out to him and add value on a regular basis are the first ones he thinks of when he does come across those types of opportunities. So I think, again, making a concerted effort both as a broker to add value to the people that you're targeting, which are the property owners. And then if you're an investor, making a concerted effort to provide value to those people who you're targeting, which are the brokers, is really ultimately the lesson here. Yeah, great insights right there. You talked about if you are a newer broker and trying to grow and trying to get some traction as a new agent, one of the things you want to do is, first of all, align yourself with a more experienced brokerage team. That way you can leverage their experience, the deal flow that they have, and start to gain that knowledge yourself, working closely with the deals they have. From there, just focus on adding value. If you can do that, that's going to be the way to start getting some traction. And as an investor, really understanding how do you stand out with these brokers? Because Everybody calls and gives them their shopping list. That's not going to help stand out, right? Everybody, especially in the market where everybody's shopping for the same thing. Hey, I want to value add B-class property that does double digit returns. All of us want that, right? So that's not going to help you stand out if you're getting multiple calls a week from investors with the same criteria as mine. But the one way you can stand out is to add value. And you mentioned Bo Berry. Bo was a guest on his show. And he wrote a great book called Multifamily Investors Who Dominate, which we'll link to that in the show notes. But it's a great resource if you do want to learn more about how to stand out. I want to push on that point one more time just to really help get a little bit more context on things we can do to add value. Because I think some investors, especially newer investors, don't really understand how to add value to a broker. So can you give us a little bit of context of what can an investor do to add value to a broker, especially about a listing or just trying to get some traction building that relationship? I think first and foremost, starting to try to build some form of relationship. So I'm always open to grab coffee with someone getting a little bit of insights on who you are as a person, your background, et cetera, is a good starting point because at first you're not going to have a lot of experience. So that's one thing is you want to first off, get some FaceTime and at least have that conversation and ask the other person how they can be a value. You can be a value to them. Number two is aligning with someone who's a little bit more experienced as far as the 
acquisition is concerned, because if you're just a new investor, have no experience in any type of investing, it's going to be very hard to get a deal done. And as a broker, you got to think about what's the viability of us getting something done together. Because if I'm having to spin my wheels to get you in contact with everyone, and even then it's not going to get the deal done, then I'm going to be very hesitant about moving forward because we don't get paid for our time unless we close a transaction. And so we invest in those that we think can actually execute on a transaction. So aligning with someone who has more experience than you, and even if you have to give up a significant portion of whatever those returns are, just getting the flywheel spinning as far as those investment opportunities, in my opinion, is going to be a game changer for you as an investor starting out. And so usually when people call me that they don't necessarily have a significant amount of experience investing, I'll typically ask them who are they teamed up with or are they teamed up with someone else that has experience because otherwise it's just not going to be as fruitful. I think that's great insight and I appreciate the honesty because a lot of times new investors just don't hear this directly. And if you're calling, calling a broker, asking about deals, telling them your criteria, you got to understand it's a two-way street. Brokers don't get paid until a deal is done. So how much time do you think they really want to spend talking to you and educating you if they're not certain you can even get the deal done if they were to find the deal you're looking for so building that credibility and working on your team and getting those other folks in your corner that's going to help you stand out to a broker as someone who's credible i think the other thing when it comes to adding value is just respond if you're looking at a deal give actual feedback hey i like the deal the numbers don't work because of xyz or i feel like hey we're gonna have to invest x amount into renovations. And I feel based on that, the numbers don't work. Because the way I look at it with the brokers that we speak to, a lot of times brokers are representing that seller, but you don't know the dynamic of that relationship. Maybe the broker says, hey, I feel like this is, you're asking way too much. And I don't think a lot of investors are going to come in at that number, but that seller may be adamant and just saying, hey, it's a hot market. I don't care. Put it up there at 20% over asking and see what happens. So sometimes you can actually give them some feedback on what you see in the marketplace. And that can actually help a broker as well, at least to come back and say, hey, we've had this out there for two months. We've only got one offer and they were all lowball offers. We actually think if you want to sell this thing, we're going to have to be closer to this range. So just giving feedback. I mean, if that's sometimes all you can offer, but I think it could be helpful if you're actually giving real-time feedback to that broker and it allows you to stand out because I imagine for you, you have a lot of people who tell you what their criteria is, but when you put a deal in front of them, you don't hear from all of those people that, yep, I love the deal. Here's my offer. A small number probably reach out and those are the people who probably stay top of mind. Yeah, no, for sure. And part of it too is that maybe they do have the experience or they do have the credibility as far as their ability to execute, but maybe their expectations of what's out there currently is also skewed as well. So finding a 12 cap in an environment may not be feasible right now. So if that's your expectations after a while, it's like, okay, well, maybe we should start looking at another opportunity as well. And I think one of the insights that we got from Bo is he's saying like, you don't always have to hit home runs, like hit singles, because the people who hit singles and doubles over a 20 year period, if you can get a 20% return year over year for 20 years, I mean, you're going to be very wealthy and you may not double your money in two years, but if you do 10 deals where you're getting 15 to 20% return, that compounds over time. So. No, great insight right there. Raphael, you gave some great information for us. For folks who want to learn more about you, want to learn more about maybe commercial real estate investing, they can check you out at your website, Rafael Coyoza. Coyoza, sorry. Coyaso, Coyaso. Coyaso. Ah, I was uh, close before. And I you're feel like close. I you're close. I got to no look at it. Rafael <laughs> Coyazo.com. That's R A P H E L C O L L A Z O.com. We'll certainly make sure we link to that so you can access that easily. Give me a failure or an apparent failure that sets you up for later success. Wow. Profound question. A failure. Oh, so yeah, I would say the first significant failure I experienced was related to my business. So I had a small catering company in college. While I was in college, I started at and junior year essentially and we started doing small corporate luncheons here and there for different corporate clients we did a lot for student organizations on campus and then right out of college i got accepted into an incubator in phoenix to be able to grow the business and potentially start a restaurant it was called posticity and through my connection with the incubator i had the opportunity to meet several entrepreneurs in the area and one of them was a financial advisor who owned a restaurant in town and he gave me the opportunity to manage a restaurant for six months after college. So I was doing the incubator during the nighttime and then 
I had the opportunity to manage a restaurant during the daytime. And over that period of that six months, I learned a lot about myself. First thought I wanted to be a restaurateur and build up something significant. And then after going through the process of managing a restaurant, seeing what it's really like to run a restaurant, I learned pretty quickly that it wasn't what I wanted to do long term. And coming to that realization four or five months in, was very difficult. And then obviously having the conversation with my mentor at the time was also equally difficult as well. And I went through a period where I was always doubting myself. I wouldn't say I was depressed, but I was very much in that lost state. And so I went through another four or five months where I was no longer manager because I had been relinquished to my duties there and just essentially operated within the restaurant. And then I started looking for other opportunities to move on in my career. And luckily I got the opportunity to be an implementation consultant with that company. And then I was off to a new journey, but that period of my life was very tumultuous and very confusing and just disappointing at the time, but it set me up for later success because I went through that period where I had quote unquote failed and I was able to reinvent myself. And so again, when you, if you find yourself in the period of your life similar to that, realize that as long as you consistently move forward on a day-to-day -day basis, you'll eventually make it on the other side. I appreciate you sharing that. Give me a digital or mobile resource that you recommend for your business digital or mobile resource. So it depends on whether or not you want to start a podcast. I utilize Anchor FM as far as my distribution platform. I love the podcast medium. I personally listen to podcasts and obviously we have the podcast, the Commercial Real Estate Academy. I think it's a great medium in order to build a personal brand for yourself. So if that's something you're interested in, definitely do so. Love it. Give me the book you've recommended or gifted the most in the last year. So great question. I'm a voracious reader. I love reading. And the one book that changed my life was The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy. And the premise of the book itself is the small, consistent, positive actions every day add up to massive results. And I've used that same logic to write six books. I was part of Toastmasters for many years and got the opportunity to speak in front of 2,500 students, FBLA, Future Business Leaders of America Conference. And so all that was built on top of each other over a period of five to six years. But now it's I've been able to do what I've done and I apply that method every single day. I also recommend The Miracle Morning, win the mornings and you win the day. And so that those are the two books that I probably recommend the most. Give me a daily habit that helps you stay focused on your goals. Great question. I would say one thing that's kind of built on top of everything for me has been my daily writing habit. And I've fallen off of it a little bit recently, but my daily goal for several years was 250 to 500 words a day. I mean, that's kind of built up my ability, in my opinion, to communicate effectively. And again, as an engineer, I'm not a natural communicator. It's just not really something that I was naturally good at. But over time, I've been able to improve my communication, both in written form and in speaking form as a result of me engaging in that habit on a day-to-day -day basis. All right, what's your number one insight for commercial real estate investing? Be consistent and then don't get disheartened. I mean, I know several investors, very successful investors that they say that they review 100 deals to get one deal. So you're going to face a lot of failure, but if you're consistent about getting out there, building your pipeline and building strong relationships with the people you need to build relationships with, eventually it'll happen. So there you go. And you've mentioned Posticity as the company you have founded before. You're in Louisville, but I know you've lived in Puerto Rico, you lived in Italy. I'm really excited to hear your answer for this one, but give me your favorite place to grab a bite to eat in Louisville. In Louisville? Oh, man. There's give so me many Louisville and then you can open it up. Man. Yeah. Any place anywhere, can... anywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. No, I would say La Bodiguita de Mima is a Cuban restaurant here in Louisville. It's located in the Nulu area, which is a very vibrant area of Louisville here. And we have a pretty large Cuban community here in Louisville. And I mean, again, it's Caribbean food, very similar to Puerto Rican food. And I'm a huge fan of Puerto Rican food as I am half Puerto Rican. So that's probably my favorite place. What's the name of it again? La Bodiguita de Mima. So the small house of Mima. Mima is like a terminology, like a mom, like a, yeah. Awesome, man. It sounds like a great option right there. I just want to say, man, it's been great talking to you. For folks who do want to learn more, they can check out your website. Again, we'll link to that at the bottom in the show notes there. But you gave some great insights. First of all, sharing your story of how you went from being in the software engineering side to being a commercial real estate agent and really understanding how to look for opportunities, what to look for in these opportunities. If you are looking to get into retail and kind of expand it beyond multifamily, but also understanding the leases and how important the leases are when it comes to a retail investing and understanding where the 
opportunities lie there, but also sharing what it takes to have a successful business. And if you're an investor, what it takes to build a great relationship with that broker, how you can add value to that individual and stand out so you can ultimately do more deals. So Rafael, just want to thank you again for coming on the show, sharing these insights with us. And we hope you have a great day. Thanks, John. It was great. It was a pleasure being here. Thank you for listening to this episode of Multifamily Insights, the podcast to help you become a better apartment investor. If you like this show, I need you to do three easy things. One, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. Two, leave us a rating and review so we can learn what you love about the show and how to make it better. And three, just chill to the next episode.